Our topic today is distinctive brand assets and deploying them to supercharge advertising effectiveness. And I have a confession to make. I love advertising. I am so passionate about advertising, so I'm really in a good role. I spent quite a bit of time before joining Communicus, about 15 years at DDB on the agency side of the world and developed my love for good advertising there. And when I say I love advertising, I love good advertising. And when I say good advertising, I don't necessarily mean just plain old likable ads. Um, I'm talking about advertising that really works, that drives success. Um, I drive my husband crazy sometimes because we'll be watching TV and I'll just say, oh, how could they be doing that? And it's not that it's obnoxious or anything, it's just that I know deep down in my heart that's not an effective ad that they're spending all this money on. So I'm really passionate about advertising. Um, and my partner in crime today, Eliana, is yeah. also passionate about advertising. Yes, I'm passionate about advertising. I'm more passionate about growing brands. Mm -hmm. and, and, that's how I, um, and that's how I see my role at Jenner Mills um, in the Global Consumer Insights function. Uh, we are obsessed with finding growth opportunities for our businesses. I lead our Global Foresights team. Um, and that team is in charge of uh, developing growth frameworks for our, for a company, um, activating behind market forces, and also bringing in modern capabilities. And how do we do research better and better to be more predictive? Um, and so that's why, and advertising is probably one of the biggest levers that we have for growing brands. And so we've been partnering for over a year um, with Communicus to really understand what are the key drivers of advertising. So I'm gonna start with a quick, quiz and I want you to scream the first word that comes to mind okay just one word okay just because we smoke our new beef short ribbon brisket Harvey's crows <laughs> beef all right another one all right it took less than two seconds for all of you to associate to either Okay, another one. Let's do another one. I'm going to move fast. Coke, Disney, Apple, All right, so that is what we're here to talk about today, right? Uh, it took you less than two seconds to bring an association, and some of you an emotion, you say gross, right? That's an emotion um, associated with a, with a particular brand when I show these cues. And that is what we're here to talk about today, the power behind distinct brand assets. Um, and so why are these so powerful? Why are these string by assets so powerful? So I'm pretty sure you've seen this. Who has seen this? Who has seen this? Okay. I thought more people had seen this. So, um, so pretty much it's, uh, our cartoonish saying, where's my brand? Where is my brand? And I hate to break it with you, for you because I know we're obsessed about brands and that's what we do in a day, day in and day out. But the brand is nowhere in consumers' mind. Fifi is actually more important than brand, which I assume is the furry, um, the furry member of the family there. Um, and so consumers don't think about our brands in our day-to-day -day basis. They're just not relevant in their lives, right? So we need to find ways to really um, trigger consumers' mind to think about our brands. And if our advertising doesn't do that, then you're not creating advertising. You're just making entertainment, right? So that's why DBAs are so important. Also, um, we found that when consumers are consuming content and media, most of, why do you, why do you consume media, Kari? Entertainment. What else? What emotion? Someone else. Why do you consume media? To escape. To escape. So um, a lot of what consumers, uh, the brain when consumers are consuming media, it's in a state of relax. And when you're relaxed, the brain is lazy. And so that not only they're not thinking about our brands, but in the moment when we're showing up in their lives, it's the moment when they don't really want to think. Right? And so we gotta tap into kind of that unconscious system one intuitive part of their brains to really trigger emotions against our brands um, and really trigger any kind of association in our advertising. So that's why DBAs are important. Um, and what can a DBA do for the brand? The first thing is Q, trigger, right? I talked about that. Quick trigger to what this brand, what this advertising is about, association with the brand. And, and, and Jerry will talk about more how that, how, how that is so important to driving results. Um, 
Second um, is what I call stacking effect, right? You want all of your campaign to have some cohesion and queue. But the reality is that most of consumers won't be exposed to more than one or two, depending on the weight that you're putting behind the campaign, but they won't be exposed to a lot of your creative. But if they are, you want them to kind of communicate as something that is consistent about your brand. So it provides cohesion and coherence to your campaign. And then finally, which for me is the most important part of DBAs, is that this symbols and triggers and images, um, they carry meaning behind them. Um, and it's not only that you can name the brand, in many cases people can't name the brand, but they can think about a moment when they had the brand, they can think about a feeling that they had when they had the brand. Um, and so it triggers, it, it could, they could trigger a benefit, right? You see an image and you're like, oh, that is a benefit of fast or quick. Um, and that is the most important part of DBAs, the meaning that they carry behind them. So, what are we set to do? So just to kind of set the stage for the challenge of advertising and how DBAs, why DBAs can be so powerful, we know that most ads go unnoticed. There's a statistic that's been floating out there for years that I can't figure out where it came from. It's a little unbelievable, but I keep reading it in different sources that consumers are exposed to 5,000 ads a day. I'm not sure that that's actually the case, but we do know from our research that a lot of known exposures go unnoticed. People just aren't paying attention. Um, but you will pay attention to some ads and not other ads. So that's one of the challenges that we, when we think about how to create good advertising, we have to figure out how to get people to pay attention. We also know, oops, um, and we also know that it's not just about spending more money. So you can spend a lot of money on an ad that is just not engaging, um, and it's still not going to be engaging. So if we've got TRPs or a measure of, of exposures along the bottom um, and the percent that are aware of that ad along the top, that's not a very strong correlation. There's some ads at the really low spending level that have high awareness and likewise ads at the high spending level that have low awareness. So it's not a matter of just spending more money, just getting it in front of them more times until they finally notice it. The second challenge that advertisers face is that over half of ads that are noticed are not connected to the brand. Um, it varies by category, it varies by media platform, in television, in CPG, 43% of the people that remember having seen a particular ad can tell us what brand it's for. So there's a lot of leverage in there and there are great ads that 90% remember and there are really lousy ads that 0% remember. So there's a really important dynamic that goes on here when people process ads in their brain. Um, we've done a lot of research on Super Bowl ads and we call it the Super Bowl effect. There's so many ads that are specifically designed in the Super Bowl to break through, to be entertaining and to get talked about. Um, but nobody has any clue what brand it is that's being advertised. So that's really important. And why that's important is that without brand linked awareness, you are virtually guaranteed that the consumer is not going to think differently or behave differently towards your brand. Um, at Communicus, we look at both this front side of the equation, which is our people seeing ads and getting the brand, but we also do research that, that identifies whether the advertising is actually changing how they feel about a brand and how they behave towards a brand. Um, and if you don't have this first half, the second half is never going to happen. So it's critically important um, that we understand how to get ads that are going to break through and that are going to be, be um, communicating the brand. And our topic today, DBAs to the rescue. So what we set out to do, we did some very specific research with General Mills to help them think about DBAs. Um, and the idea was, let's develop an understanding of the best practices use of DBAs in advertising for General Mills. So General Mills has a lot of brands, a lot of different ad campaigns. Let's look across these campaigns and see what we can learn about distinctive brand assets and what they bring to the party. Um, and then, because we want the research to be not just interesting but actionable, let's provide guidelines for those who hope to build and harness the power of DBAs. So that's what we're going to share with you today. What did we do? 
Um, first of all, we started from the premise that a distinctive brand asset is only a distinctive brand asset if the consumer says so. It's not enough that the marketing director says, I know that when I use the color yellow, that just really conveys all the qualities that are true of my brand. So we did some research. We didn't want to necessarily question their beliefs. Um, but we wanted to let the consumer tell us. So we did a consumer survey, very simple, straightforward, to quantify the strengths of DBA associations for specific DBAs on specific brands. So we did 500 online interviews, nothing very fancy. Uh, parents 25 to 54, which is one of the more general targets for General Mills brands, primary grocery shoppers. We just showed them a DBA or played them one if it was an audio one and said, what brand do you associate with this with? So it was a very simple, what percent associate it with the correct brand, what percent misassociate it, and what percent just don't have any associations with it. So this is our first piece of the puzzle. Secondly, we did a content analysis. So this, we went back to our offices, we hired people, we trained them, we said, okay, watch all of these commercials and quantify how many DBAs are present and what those DBAs are. So we said, uh, we looked at 32 ads, um, TV or, and or online video ads. Um, how many D DBAs are present? What type of DBAs are they? Is it a character? Is it a sound? Is it a color? Where do they first, at what point, what point in the commercial do they first appear? And how long are they present for? So we're just quantifying all of the DBAs across these commercials. Um, and then we went into the data that we had already collected, which is how successful were these 32 commercials in market? Using our methodology where we measure awareness of advertising, we show people a clip of an ad to trigger their memory. If they remember it before, we know they'll be able, that memory will be triggered by that exposure. We ask them some certifying questions to, to determine whether they really have seen the ad before. So we had that data on these 32 ads. So basically, we looked at the known performance of these 32 ads and we mixed it all up. We said, do DBAs help ads to succeed in terms of breaking through generating awareness and brand linkage um, and how and whether and when they do. So we're just simply relating the DBA scores to the awareness metrics and branding metrics. So very straightforward in terms of what we're looking at here. The hypothesis is that DBAs might help ads perform better in terms of breakthrough and branding, and that's really what we set about to test. So what did we learn? First, I'm going to give you some kind of general quantitative findings, um, and then Eliana is going to come back and talk more about the real meat of it, like which DBAs work and, and why do certain DBAs, types of DBAs work and, and others not work. So we developed a metric that we call DBA density. What this simply reflects is how many DBAs are being used in the ad. Is it an ad that has, relies on one? Are there six in the ad? Um, how strongly linked to the brand are those DBAs? So if you've got a DBA that's got maybe 20% linkage among consumers with your brand, that's not going to get as much weight as one that 90% of consumers associate it with your brand. And how long is each DBA on screen? So this is our DBA density score. So the first question is, okay, um, as Eliana said, the first benefit of DBAs is supposed to be that they cue the brand. Well, do they? They do. DBAs deliver on the promise of improving brand linkage. So if the brand linkage norm is 53%, that's the average, the percent of people who remember a given ad, 43% of them can tell us what brand, correctly identify which brand is being advertised. So that's the average ad. If you've got high DBA density ads, um, you're going to bump that all the way up to 67%. So clearly, high density DBA ads are helping people go, oh, that's an Arby's ad. Oh, that's a nationwide ad. Having a lot of them a lot of the time and DBAs that are strongly associated with your brand. Compared to low DBA density ads, significantly below average in terms of brand linkage. So that's well and good. Um, but the next finding was a little bit surprising until we really stopped to think about it. Um, the the first piece of our equation here is you need to break through. People need to notice your ads. When it comes to actually breaking through and generating engagement, 
um, the DBA story isn't quite as simple. There's in fact such thing as too much DBA density. So if our norm is 29%, on average 29% of a target audience remembers that has exposure opportunity remembers having seen that ad, the high DBA density ads were actually only 21%. Whereas ads that had a lot of strong DBAs um, but low density did better. So what does this mean? What it means is that if you've got ads that all they are is the same old, same old, and there's nothing fresh and new about the ad, people are going to say, ah, I've seen that one before. I, I'm not really interested because I've, I've seen an ad that looks like that before. So the point with DBAs is it's, it's really important to have strong DBAs, um, but it's also important to keep it fresh in any given ad, to introduce some new twist or have some slightly different storyline, different use of the DBA um, so that the consumers don't get bored and the campaign doesn't wear out. Um, and then the marketing director, director wants to throw out all the DBAs with the bathwater and then you've got nothing left and have to start from scratch, which is not a place that any, any of you should want to be. Um, so that's kind of the quantitative piece of it, um, but a DBA is not a DBA is a DBA. There's a lot of different types of DBAs and they perform differently in market and Eliana is going to talk to you about some of these types. And what we All right, so quantity matters when it comes to DBAs, but quality matters even more. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit of the different types of DBA and the role that they can do in the advertising with a lot of examples, obviously, and many of them examples from General Mills. So the first um, DBA that is really strong and that we saw to be kind of uh, strongly associated with the brand is characters, right? Um, and again, I'm going to show a few of these um, to talk about them. Uh, but why are characters so powerful? Um, the number one reason why characters are so powerful is because they make you feel something. And they are very distinctively uh, bring the tone of the brand to life in the ads. And again, these are some of the most iconic ones uh, that you've seen. Uh, the Doughboy. Who wants to guess how old is the Doughboy? Mm -hmm. How old? Yes. 50 years old. <laughs> no, he's older. He was, he was born in 1965. Um, and again, so he's been out there a little bit, a little bit older than that. Um, and so he's been out there for, for a long time. And what I would say, we have learned a lot on how to use and how not to use the Doughboy. And one takeaway that I would leave with you is, if you're gonna use your character, use it in a meaningful way. It's gotta have a big role in the advertising. If you are just gonna put it at the end and put it as a prop, don't even bother. They have to have a meaningful role in your advertising. And by the way, use them because they have a lot of power. Uh, the, the gecko and, and again, differentiation is another way that we've seen characters being used. The insurance business, sorry, I'm in the food business, so I think insurance is really boring. Um, <laughs> and, and, but how do you bring fun to insurance, right? Um, and they've created all of these characters, either the gecko um, in 1999, and it, it was in 1999 when they created, there was very, very low awareness about the brand. Uh, and so it kind of brings kind of a suave personality. Then does anyone know what Affleck stands for? Yes, right, <laughs> right, right. Um, and so the, to the point, right, uh, they created this character uh, with this uh, doc to really try to make people remember their brand because no one wouldn't even remember the brand and with a with an added sound. And if you think about that industry, there's flow, there's mayhem. And in a way, the characters have almost like overtaking the power of the brand um, as a way to differentiate between the different um, the different um, companies. Then we have Chester. And Chester is an interesting case study, uh, Chester the Cheetah. Uh, it was created when there was a SAG award, uh, a, a SAG, um, the Screen Actors Guild, um, they had a, um, a strike, so there weren't any actors available for the advertising. <laughs> Which, by the way, characters are better than actors because they don't carry baggage and they might not go crazy when they're in Vegas. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and so they said, well, we're just going to have to create a character that is cool and fun and that brings the, to life the brand. Um, and, um, and, and again, he's, he was created in 1986. And I would say they have not changed him a lot. Um, the only thing they've done is like a little nip and tuck here with a computer generated, uh, but there's no kind of extreme makeover when, it's, when it links to um, 
uh, characters. And then finally, the Green Giant. And, and we sold this brand a couple of years ago. And the company that bought it, I think they were brilliant with their advertising because we hadn't used the Green Giant in a really long time. In the kind of in the trap of trying to be modern and, and more about fresh and be, um, you know, and, and kind of address millennials. And they brought back the Green Giant with a lot of new, new innovation and products. And the ad was about the Green Giant is back. And they went on allocation um, when they brought back this advertising, which is just so powerful, right? To have these characters associated with your brands. Um, and then the second rule is use it or lose it. So how many of you knew that this bunny was actually a Duracell character. It it's not, it's Edgerton. Oh, oh yes, outside the US, yes. Uh, so um, in the US, that's true, Rob. Um, in the US, the Energizer bunny, uh, they've done over 115 ads, Energizer. The, uh, it started by Duracell and then they kind of like brought it bigger because uh, it was like not as, as um, it didn't have as much personality. And if you think how a uh, character can transcend culture, this is almost a synonym for uh, being energized, right? Or someone that has energy. So they can transcend culture to um, the characters, but use them or lose them because someone can steal them from you for sure. One of the biggest challenges you have as a, as a, as a brand is to engage the non-engage, right? To engage non-users. And the, the logic will tell you, well, you want to do something new and fresh to go after a new consumer. Why would you tap into your most iconic DBAs to tap into those consumers? And actually what we found out in the data was that uh, DBAs were almost as effective with an engaging non-users as engaging users. And I think the reason why is, um, again, a lot of these are very iconic DBAs, but it just triggers a differential emotion or a curiosity around a personality and around a brand that makes people intrigued about what that is. Um, which is again, uh, you know, sometimes in the spirit of modernization and moving the brand to a different place, you might step away from those iconic elements about your brand uh, because you want to engage a non-user. And the reality is that that's where, that's the crux of how you engage your user, kind of the old being you a little bit. Um, Product DBAs, this is our, these I think are critical in the food industry. So oats, oats are associated with heart health, but there's a big competitor out there that makes a lot of oats. Um, I won't mention them. Um, <laughs> um, and so we had that challenge, right? Like, so how do we own the heart health benefits of oats in our biggest iconic brand Cheerios? And so what we did is we kind of used um, and this is in our package, uh, a little bowl with has the heart shape and has this, the, the signature Cheerio um, in it. And that is one of the most powerful DBAs we have uh, because it's in context of a benefit. So there's an association with it without even us having to communicate. And that is, it, it, you cannot confuse it with that other competitor oats that are more boring. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the other one is, uh, um, kind of to bring some distinctive voice and uh, a different feeling to your brand. Um, and, and again, these, I think these are probably the biggest celebrities out there, these two guys. Um, and again, they weren't created that long time ago. And that's our crazy square. They are cannibalistic, they eat each other. Um, but it's because it brings to life that benefit of craveability, right? That they're so good that they're gonna eat each other. So it's bringing that craveability benefit to life in a very distinct, crazy way. And that's part of it, they're the crazy squares. And then these guys, right? They, they are an, an ensemble and every time there's a new color, every one of them has a personality. They transcend now. Um, it's about bring, and it was created because Mars wanted to bring fun back to the, to the candy aisle. And that's how they brought them to life. And then final, this is so, this one is a great case study because it's about thinking about your product and how the usage or rituals around your product can provide a distinctive brand asset. If I would have shown you this, you would have said Corona right away, right? And now no, no other competitor can own that. Um, and they just added a line, which was a ritual on how you drink beer in Mexico, added a line to that visual, and now they created an iconic DBA that no one else can copy. Um, another one great example, which is again, a good way of thinking about how do I find DBAs and create them, 
and it's rituals of consumption, right? It's the milk ad. Like, yeah, milk can be a little boring, right? And when this, with this milk mustache that they created, this kind of iconic image, you immediately associate that with a campaign got milk, right? Um, and, and it's been used pretty consistently. So those are product DVAs. I'm gonna scare you even more, so be prepared. That's why. So the power of sound. Um, I think we believe that sound is the most universal language, right? And um, and if you think about, um, and if if you know, we heard the nationwide one. I'm I'm not from the U.S. I lived in another place before coming to the U.S. I'm from Venezuela and. Um, McDonald's forever has done ba -na -ba -ba -ba. and wherever you go, every single phrase of those, if you read that phrase in Spanish, if you read it in French, if you read it in English, they all mean different things. But that ba -na -na -ba -ba, it's consistent across the world and it gives you a, a way to kind of bring universal language to your, to, your, to your brand. And I think in combination, it provides more character and more roundness to to your, to your product. And I'll talk a little bit more about sound at the end too, because I have another example. There's also power in sound in the rituals of consumption. So I'll give you a few examples after that a little bit later. All right, so taglines. So I've talked about sound and images and characters um, and probably where we put most of our energy when we're developing campaigns and we have long discussions with our agency is like, what is the campaign idea? What's the tagline? I hate to break it to you, but taglines are not, are not strong DBAs. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna show it and I want you to scream, this is a car, right? These are all car taglines and I want you to tell me the brand and see, let's see how many people guess. I might not remember them all, so. <laughs> Go places. Go further. <laughs> Drive one. The passionate pursuit of perfection. Precision crafted. Precision crafted performance. Those are all great campaign ideas in a brief. Not really consumer remembering those things. And another thing about taglines is that, um, again, it's words and it's harder for consumers to remember words. Um, they, also, they also kind of typically appear at the end of the ad, and by the end of that, the, the story has been completed, and so there's this cognitive closure effect that people kind of, once the story closes and then you show this, people just don't think, they're not processing information anymore. So if, if you're gonna use it, not necessarily leave it at the end. There is obviously exceptions, right? Um, two exceptions that we, one exception that we discovered in our own work was to crave those crazy squares. Why this one was um, more of a DBA for that brand? Because it kind of explains the ad in a way, oh, that's why they're eating each other, because they're crazy and they're craveable, right? Because you see the ad and you're like, oh, they're, the cereals are eating each other, what's going on? Uh, but this kind of like really rounds it up and explains it. And then the other one, the one that everyone points out, just do it. They've been using this for 30 years. So if you can make your agency and your brand team stick to the same campaign for 30 years, just give me a call. Because um, <laughs> that's really, really hard, right? It's stick and, it's, um, and they've been consistent for 30 years. So that's why kind of like don't rely too much on the tagline as a way to make a distinctive um, campaign. Um, all right, so. To dial up distinction, again, there, there's no single-minded mentality in DBAs. Um, it's kind of like a little bit of the more the better, but it's all need to kind of, they all need to go together. So we're gonna do an exercise on this one um, because sometimes it's not about each of them being distinct, but the combination of them and how they're used together being distinct. So who, what, is, what does this make you think? The 70s. people, what? 70s. Okay, 70s, anything else? Okay, all right, so not, you know, you can't really relate it to any brand, right? What about this? Elvis? All right, still, no, right? These are DBAs that you're gonna, they're gonna reveal very quickly. What about this? All right, and what about this? Right, so, I live in Minnesota, Prince is our hero, um, and I live actually very close to Paisley Park where, where Prince um, used to live. And so Prince is the perfect example of a combination of DBAs, right? Each of these things in separate, you wouldn't know what it is, but he always had it 
all of them together. And when I say always, always, I actually ran into him in a coffee shop. I have to tell the story because it's too good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and of course, you're there kind of grabbing coffee. No one bothers him. Um, and he comes in. It's winter time. Full bell buttons, platform shoes, necklaces, all these scarves. Again, it wasn't that, but he was full on Prince. And so I tell my teams in, in Minnesota, uh, because Prince is our hero, just be like Prince. That's our, what our brands need to be. Always, always show up with your DBAs combined in a way that makes sense. You can't show up one way in one creative, one way in the store in a very different way um, when you're kind of interacting experiential with them. So show up like Prince. I was so like ah that I didn't even take a picture, which I still regretted, but I did see him. Um, all right. And so the pinnacle of success, and I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about this brand a little bit more, is using, creating a set of DBAs, not just one, right? And if you think about Lucky Charms, Lucky Charms stands, stands for a sense of wonder, rainbows, um, imagination, magic. Um, and one of the things that we found out about a, a year and a half, two years ago, um, was that there was this character that was very, very popular with little girls. I have an eight-year-old girl. Anyone has a girl here? What's the most popular character that they're obsessed with when they're like five to seven? Unicorns, unicorns yeah. right? So unicorns were really in. We didn't have to do a lot of research for that. Um, unicorns were really in. And guess who can own unicorns? Who can own unicorns, right? We said, you know what? We can own unicorns, right? Because we own rainbows, we own magic, we own imagination, and we've been using it so consistently that for the first time in 10 years, we decided to add a Marbit to our, 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 our cereal because it was very special unicorn um, Marbit. And um, again, I'm going to show you the image that the New York Post put on when we share results from this campaign. That is our CEO. <laughs> it is my favorite image ever. <laughs> when you see your CEO riding a unicorn, um, it doesn't get better than that. Um, and 20% growth, 20% wow. growth in one of the largest cereal brands. Yeah. Um, and it's because we've had, and we brought it to life in a very consistent way, using all of our DBAs together and taking ownership of the unicorn. And I know our competitors are trying to kind of do it, but they're just going to drive uh, towards, towards Lucky Charms because it's so well tied to the brand. So when incorporating DBA, so uh, again, think about multiple DBAs. And again, don't, don't take away here that you're just going to create an ad with a lot of images. There's got to be a story that is interesting and fresh every time. And you got to kind of renew it all the time because if not, you get tired and, 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 and the brand awareness does go down. Um, but think multiple DBAs. Uh, make sure that it's not, again, that the story is unique, um, but that the DBAs are present throughout. It's not at the end. Don't do branding at the end. It's the worst mistake ever. Uh, we've learned it maybe many times the hard way. Use them or lose them. Don't forget about using them or losing them. Someone can steal them from you. Again, we grab that unicorn, and now that's ours, even if they want to take it away from us. It's ours. Um, and think refresh, refresh not, uh, not replace. I, I read somewhere preparing for this that they're, they're trying to make the Energizer bunny thinner. And I was like, oh, I don't know. But you can refresh them similar to kind of Chester the Cheetah now being computer generated. It just looks a little bit more up to date, but it's the same exact character. Um, and if you don't have a suite of DBA, and I know a lot of you might be thinking, well, my brand is not iconic. It hasn't been out there for 30 years or 20 years. So how am I going to do this? Um, so when you're creating products and where you're thinking about your brand, think about what's distinct? What is distinct to you that no one else owns? What is authentic to the story of the brand or to the product? And what is relevant in today's world? Um, and be tenacious. Again, this is not one thing that builds upon in one campaign. You kind of have to be tenacious in how you're using it year over year. And when starting a journey, uh, don't limit yourself to characters. That's the easiest one. Consider the product itself and don't discount the, the power of sound in your product. I want to use this example because um, is any of you, are you familiar with We? That's the, 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 one of the largest launches in the yogurt category um, that we launched about a year ago. And this product not only was created, um, again, it was all inspired by how French make 
um, yogurt. Um, and the team was very thoughtful on bringing and creating DBAs from the start that were unique and distinct to the brand. And one of the things they did is they, we, put it in a, we put it in a glass pot instead of a plastic pot, right? And you can think about how that is a hard decision to make because of profit and all of that. But that was distinct to the French proposition. So they stayed true to that. And not only that, in the advertising, one of the things you hear every time the advertising opens is someone click, clink, clink, linking, clicking the, the pod, which is a way for you to create sound through your product. Um, another example of that, Pillsbury, the can dough, when you open it, it pops. It pops and people get scared, and it's very distinct, and consumers always tell, I get scared, I get scared. Well, you know what, now we use it in our advertising, because that sound is very breakthrough, and people say like, oh, that's a Pillsbury ad, just by hearing the sound of the can. Um, or when you're doing um, um, taco shells, right, the crunch of ta uh, taco shells is something that can be very distinctively, a distinct sound that you link to your product too. So, all right, so, don't be the brand that keeps making excuses for not creating them. No, it, I'll just jump in here. I've heard so many times when we talk about distinctive brand assets, they're sitting around a table going, yeah, but we don't have any and it takes too long to develop. And it's like every journey starts with a single step. So yeah. don't be that brand. All right. So I do want to end it with a couple of examples from the campaigns that we used for this research. These were the two highest rated campaigns from brand awareness and i can tell you now they actually drove our business significantly too um because we've done marketing mix on all of them too um and and again one is a great example of a modern way of using your dbas so i think it's a great and using sound and creating a new sound for a brand and the other one is a great example and i'll talk a little bit more later about about bringing bringing back a character how do you bring him back in a, in a way that is true to what that character is and what they mean to consumers. So I'll show them and then maybe we go to questions. Good goes around and around and around. Good goes around and around and around. Good goes around and around. Good goes around and around. We believe. We hadn't used the doughboy for two years. And this was the ad where we kind of like reintroduced the doughboy. She can speak for off the charts <laughs> results. Um, and it's a super simple idea, right? But he is the main character in the ad, bringing all the joy of the holidays together with none other than I don't, Santa. Like it's just poking their bellies. It's just so cute. So, all right. So thank you so much. Uh, we are, you know, we're open to questions. I think we have couple minutes left for questions, right? Yes? Yeah, how important do you think it is for a brand to try to stay consistent internationally? Do you think it's worth it or do you think sometimes it's a mistake? Um, so I used to, one of the roles I had, I let all the work for Hagen does in international. And I would say, it's, it, I think it, it is important. I think it is important that consumers have a consistent experience around their brand wherever, whenever they are. Um, and, and again, there are things and elements about how they're brought to life that might change, um, but you can drive stronger results, I think, if there's, at, at least in the use of your DBAs. I think the executions behind them can vary to be a little bit more culturally nuanced. Um, but for example, Hagen Dust, which is our global brand, we went through um, uh, a long redesign process in international. You don't see it here, Nestle uh, runs the brand here. Um, and that one of the things that we discover is that a way to bring cohesion to the brand and the promise of the brand of being extraordinary and the most extraordinary experience was to use consistently these DBAs everywhere the brand showed up, not, even, not only in packaging, but also in the 900 stores that we have. Um, and that communicates, and if you think about any big luxury um, and premium brands, it's a, it's a sign of premiumness. Coherence, I call it coherence, not consistency. They gotta be coherent. Um, and the way that you're using it. So I, I do believe that there's strength in, consist in, in coherence around the DBAs. And if you think about the fact that um, a brand really owns its, its story, its brand truths, and those would not change from market to market, that DBAs in, as an expression of that um, should transcend individual markets. Yeah, you do have to understand though the different meanings of the DBAs in different cultures, because there could be 
things that have different connotations. So it's important for you to understand what is the meaning that they communicate um, in different cultural, con cultural contexts. What tips do you have for working with, you talked about the marketers who want to do something new and shake it up, but actually going and sticking with the tried and true seems to work. What tips do you have from your experience on how to engage the marketers in that way and help them come around to that point of view? Do presentations like this. Yes. <laughs> so we've been doing a lot of internal education and a lot of research on research on the power of DBAs and trying to do a lot of work on how we First of all, uncovering which of those DBAs are, documenting them um, is very important. So having great brand fundamental um, documents that really not only document which ones they are, but what's the meaning, what's the strength behind them. Um, it's very important, I think. Um, and so that's, that's one way. And I think um, what you need to help them understand is like this is kind of like um, the, your, your foundation that you can build upon, it doesn't necessarily mean that you cannot be modern or bring a new story or be, be, be culturally relevant, right? Um, and the other piece too is like, we have the privilege at General Mills to have so many iconic brands, right? Um, that it's like, oh my God, why would you leave that at the table when many other brands would love mm -hmm. to have this? So that's been, I think we've really re-energized and inspired people to be a little bit more preservers of some of our DBAs. Did you look at the effect of how soon the DBA is uh, introduced in the, in the commercial? I know you said you don't want to tell the story at the end, yeah. but uh, there's been a long standing thought that the sooner you uh, introduce it, the better, but you didn't, you didn't yeah, present that's, any Yeah, that's that. a great question. So the question is how soon mm -hmm. should you introduce it right at the very beginning? <laughs> and we didn't actually find that whether it's introduced at the beginning or during the first half, is that critical? There's a lot of ads out there now that will have the logo at the beginning and then they'll go into the story. Right. And that's not necessarily particularly effective. It needs to be woven in. And if it's not woven in starting in the first frame, it's not necessarily uh, a problem. Yeah. How often would you say, in your experience, the, br the campaign needs to be refreshed? So you're sticking to the DBAs, but this whole refresh cycle. Because I know we're very we just stick to the same thing for three, four years. And yeah. Me, well, why come, come they don't yeah. So um, the the question of how <laughs> often do you refresh? A lot of it has to do with how tight of a format and how formulaic your ads are. Um, in some of the work that we did for Miller Coors <laughs> a few years ago, there was a couple of their brands that were using campaigns that were very, very formulaic. And those, not only the individual executions, but the campaign itself wore out faster because it's like, yeah, same old joke. I've seen that before. They're just executing the same thing in a different way. Whereas if you've got a campaign like the Cheerios campaign, which is now in its second year, um, it's still got all those same DBAs, but doing it in a way that's new and fresh. So we would say, don't throw out the campaign um, and its DBAs necessarily ever just keep making sure it's fresh and it's got new elements within it yeah what about are there ever DBAs that you've attempt you've seen where they were introduced attempted to be successful and I know it takes a long time and initially it just isn't getting that brand association is there some criteria or some kind of okay, we need to totally reboot here. I think the main thing that jumps out to me, and Eliana may have a different perspective on this, is the distinctiveness. <laughs> mm -hmm. If it's truly distinctive, but in a way that is appropriate for the brand, that's authentic to the brand, um, it's going to be fine. Um, but the ones that tend to not stick and not do well are the ones that are not distinctive or just not believable for that brand. And there's a lot out there that aren't distinctive that people are trying, brands are trying to own. Yeah, I would say, it, yeah, it's similar to that. Like, you kind of have to look at your competitive context and see if none of those DBAs are being used by any of your competitors, too. So when we do the work, we try to understand how kind of category typical t DBAs are on the product. If they're associated with any competitor, then we try to stay away from it, um, too, right? So, but if no one's using it and it's super relevant to the category, I would say take advantage of that, right? Um, so that's another frame to think about it. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Um, a quick question around <coughs> engagement um, in testing DBAs. Mm -hmm. um, 
Can you tell me a little bit more about how you think about engagement with DBAs and, and, and the kinds of testing you're doing to see if a freshly created DBA is appropriately engaging? So there's a couple of ways of coming at that question. In terms of understanding the DBAs, um, we're going to want to understand how well those work and uh, you know how distinctive they are and how relevant to the brand. Within the context of advertising, we want to know do they grab attention and do they get into the memory. And in-market research is really the best way to do that because in a copy testing environment where it's a forced exposure, it's really hard to get it that is this one that's going to really make people pay attention. We also know with a new campaign or with a new DBA, if you can get in market and find people who maybe you've got three ads within the campaign, you can find some people that have only seen one of them, but there's going to be some people out there that have already seen all three. And if you see that DBA developing strength as people start to get that advertising intensity, that's a really good sign that even if the numbers are low right now, they're going to build as you consistently use this thing. Yeah. Big, oh, yeah. Um, oh, I think I think we're probably at time. So if you take a brand that's just say the Doughboy, for example, and you're trying to put it into a cultural context that might be different or people don't view it as relevant, how do you approach adjusting that without throwing it out if people are rejecting it or don't like yeah. it? Or yeah, what we found out though, what we found out was that actually some of these strong iconic DBAs were pretty universally relevant. Um, across again, sometimes those are us. I would, I would, I would argue, and I would do research to really say, is that uh, an opinion about the brand team and the agency, or is it really what consumers think? Um, because what we discovered was that a lot of our, our kind of like iconic and most traditional DBAs were actually very relevant, even to the even more relevant to younger consumers because of of, of some nostalgia the involved and the memories associated with it growing up. Um, and so that was kind of something that, in a way, this research helped us uncover, that not necessarily because it's been out there for a long, again, you can, the way they use them fresh, fresh, in a fresh way is bring a new story around it, right? And I think that Cheerios Examples is a great one. It's a new song, it's a hip song, but it, that ad, and, and the, all the usage of the DBA is actually real consumer footage from online. So you're using that DBA in a very modern way. So that's, that's the way I would think about it. All right. Thank you so much.